is more intertangled than what you might realize. And we find that some of the characters like Karl Marx, his real name was Kissel Moses Mordecai Levy. Karl Marx was just an assumed name. And he worked with people over there like Lenin, whose real name was Ulanov, and the commissar of the Red Army and Navy called Leon Trotsky. His real name was Lev, Devada, but Lev Davadovich Bronstein. And when you find out how all these people have been pulling together to foment so many of these things going on here, you should be forewarned. Because this is not just accidental history. This is conspiracy. People working together to do wrong. And it, by definition, a conspiracy is just two or more people planning in secret to do something wrong. And by that definition, there must be thousands, millions, maybe even billions of conspiracies going on all the time. But you mentioned something about what's going on. Oh, that's one of them conspiracy nuts. We've all been vilified by that label. Conspiracy nut is kind of like anti-Semite. It's just a buzzword to say, they're on to us. They know who we are. They know what we're up to. Let's jump on them and vilify them. And that's the way they operate, through vilification. And if vilifying isn't enough, they'll trump up some charges. And if that's not enough, they sent in the wet agents to spill some of your blood. Well, in Dusseldorf, Germany, the communist revolution, uh, rules of revolution came to light. And in 1946, a U.S. attorney general uh, obtained a copy of the same rules from a known member of the Communist Party. And today, these same rules are in effect. And I want you to compare these concepts with modern occurrences. There's three of them. A, B, C. A, corrupt the young. Get them away from a religion. Get them interested in sex. Make them superficial and destroy their ruggedness. We sure have a lot of whips today. Some, a lot of these young kids coming up just don't seem to have what it takes anymore. But they've been through the public fool system. They've been nurtured by their television. And it's hard to think anymore. It used to be when you went to school, they taught you how to think. Now you go to school, they teach you what to think. B, get control of all means of publicity. Thereby, and there's seven parts to that, get people's minds off their government by focusing their intention, attention on athletic, sexy books, plays, and other trivialities. And boy, have we become trivial. Two, divide the people into hostile groups by constantly harping on controversial matters of no importance. Number three, destroy the people's faith in their natural leaders by holding the latter up to contempt, ridicule, and disgrace. Four, always preach true democracy, but seize power as fast and as ruthlessly as possible. Number five, by encouraging government extravagance, destroy its credit, produce fear of inflation with rising prices and general discontent. That one has really been implemented with vigor. We're playing, playing, playing welfare Santa Claus to the whole world. Now take a look at Israel alone. We send $15,500 for every man, woman, and child. That's a lot of money. Sometimes I think some of us wish, wish Gee, I wish my government would give me that much each year. Now, that's only the above board welfare. There is a sub rosa welfare. For example, 
that's our only friend in the Middle East. Therefore, we've got to have a base over there to protect them. Do they give us a base or do they rent it to us at a high price? Well, since we never find out exactly how much it's going to be, they can rent it at a high price and nobody counts it as part of the great welfare. Number six, incite unnecessary strikes in vital industries, encourage civil disorder, and foster a soft and lenient attitude on the part of government to such disorder. Number seven, by specious argument, call the breakdown of the old moral values, honesty, sobriety, self-restraint, faith in the pledged word, and ruggedness. So those are the seven reasons they wanted to get a hold of means of publicity so they could implement that. And number C of the communist rules of revolution, cause the registration of all firearms on some pretext with a view to confiscating them and leaving the populace helpless. So many of these false flag operations have gotten us into big trouble. We know now that that ship, I think it was the main or the, that was sunk down there in Cuba. We were told it's because the Spanish had mined the harbor, but we now know that the explosion took place inside the ship. It was all the excuse they needed to go attack and wage war against Spain. We see so many of those false flag operations. World War II, it was Pearl Harbor. It wasn't a false flag operation, but it was sure close to it. It was pretending like we're just innocent people standing here when six months before Pearl Harbor, our government froze all Japanese money in banks. Any way you look at it, that's theft. Three weeks before Pearl Harbor, our government gave him a 100% oil embargo. Do you remember back in the 70s when we got a 10% oil embargo from the Arabs and the lines at the gas pumps were long and we suffered under that? That was a 10% oil embargo. And our government tried to run a 100% oil embargo upon those people who just weren't going to put up with it. Now, I think Admiral Yamamoto was right that when they came over and stung us, they were only waking a sleeping lion. But there was nothing else they could do. It's either knuckle under or fight. And that's where it is to us. It's getting down to the point where you, we either knuckle under or do something to fight about this. Right now, it's a fight of words because Quite frankly, we're in a very awkward position here. It's too late to work within the system and probably too early to start shooting. And I think there's a whole lot of us here in America that really and truly are gutless. And it's only going to be the land of the free as long as it's the home of the brave. Well, we can see that after World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whose real name was Rosenfeld, hooked up with his good buddy over in the Soviet Union, a guy by the name of Joseph Stalin. His real name was Yosef Vizaranovich Jugashvili. Gashvili means son of. And he let his good buddy Joseph Stalin oversee the elections in much of Europe. And ironically, all those people decided to become pawns in the communist superstate. 
It was Joseph Stalin that said so clearly, and he, we better pay attention to what he has to say. Those who cast their votes decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything. And we saw that happen here not too long ago in America because George Bush got elected. And it was his brother down there in Florida that sure did a lot to swing the votes. Remember all those hanging and pregnant chads and all the excuses they had to not count a lot of votes and to count other ones that they shouldn't have. And it reared its ugly head here again in 2004 because down in Ohio, the people who were in charge of the election commission said to the people who were bringing in the voting machines, all right, open up your voting machines before the polls start here, because I want to see ahead of time that all the registries are set to zero, that there are no names inside. And they said, oh, no, you can't look inside these machines. It's for security. It's for the sanctity of the vote. We must not let anybody look in the machines. And they said, we're the ones in charge of seeing whether or not the sanctity of the vote is taken care of. You're going to open up those machines right now. And there was a lot of protesting, a lot of weeping, and a lot of wailing, but they did end up opening up those machines. Every machine had three to 400 votes for Bush on it already. It was a big deal down in Ohio. It was on television, it was in the newspapers, but it just didn't make its way around the rest of America. Why? Who owns the newspapers? Who owns the television? Who owns the radio? The same people that own the voting machines. There's only four companies here in America that own voting machines, and every one of them are mafia affiliates. Now, these, these television stations, ABC, NBC, CBS, and the, all the rest of them that have any influence and any power whatsoever, got together and formed a new corporation. It's called News Election Services. And they're the ones that feed information into the news election services about what's transpiring in the election and getting information back out of it. And so they have control. And it matters not who we vote for. What really counts is who does the television and the newspaper announce to be the victor. It's important because at stake, is not only our freedom, but if we don't have freedom, we don't pass it on to our children. And if they don't have it, they don't pass it on to our grandchildren. And it's important to me for subsequent generations to enjoy the treasures, the pearls, the gems of liberty. Liberty is that notion where you got a right to make a choice. You decide what's good for your life. But somehow we've got to the point where you have to get a license for everything. But as long as the people don't speak up, as long as we don't do what's necessary to inform the others around us, as long as we act lethargically rather than robust and animated champions of liberty, it'll slip right through our fingers. I have to ask you, are you willing to crank it up? Are you willing to pass out more DVDs? Are you willing to talk to more people? Are you willing to do what's necessary to safeguard our Constitution? For it was, I think it was Daniel Webster that said, Safeguard your constitution, for miracles do not cluster. What has happened once in 6,000 years may never happen again. And if the American constitution goes down, there will be anarchy in the world. Let's safeguard it like it's precious. Thank you.